Gravitational and electric fields are very similar. Most of the equations we have to do with fields are the same for both of them, but just slightly tweaked. So what is a field? A field is an invisible area in space. If you put a mass or a charge in one of these fields, gravitational and electric respectively, then they will feel a force. So let's say that I have a planet here. If I put a mass in here, near the planet, which direction is the force gonna pull? Of course, it's gonna be inwards, and it doesn't matter where I put it, the force is always gonna be directed towards the planet, because gravity is always attractive. What about if I had a proton here, though? Now, if I had an electron, then it would be attracted. If I had another proton, it would be repelled. So which way do we put the field lines? Well, they actually go outwards. And that's why field lines show the direction of the force on a point. Now, when we say point, we mean basically it has no volume itself. Show the direction of the force on a point mass. So that makes sense. I've got a point mass here, force is pulling inwards. But here, are we talking about a point negative charge or positive charge? Well, if the field lines are going away, then we're talking about a positive charge. We can call these point mass and charges test charges as well and test mass. In other words, with a point positive charge or a point mass, we're testing the gravitational field here, electric field here. What I'm going to try and do is fit everything that you need to know for fields onto one piece of paper because everything fits together so well that it's not really that helpful to separate the ideas out too much. So I'm going to be writing gravitational field equations in orange and electric field equations in blue. So apologies if it gets a bit messy. But let's start off with force. What is the force felt by two masses that are separated by a distance r? And when we talk about their separation, we are talking about the separation of their centers, not their surfaces, because we treat these as point masses. The force is given by Newton's law of gravitation. That is F equals G. That's the gravitational constant. That's not acceleration due to gravity or gravitational field strength. This is capital G. That is a universal constant. G M M over R squared. In words, force between two bodies is proportional to the product of their masses and inverse squarely proportional to their separation, the distance between their centers. Newton's gravitational constant is in your formula sheet. What about if we had two charges instead? It's very, very similar. Instead of the gravitational field constant, we have this here. This is one over four pi epsilon zero. Epsilon zero being the permittivity of free space is just a constant again. Now, because this whole thing here is a constant, we can rewrite this as just k q q over r squared. And this k ends up being nine times 10 to the nine. Instead of having to put this into your calculator every time, you can just put in nine times 10 to the nine and then carry on times in by the two charges and divide it by the separation squared. So you can see that they're very similar. Constant, times the two masses, or times the two charges, divided by r squared. What about potential energy? How much potential energy is there between these two masses here? How do we get from force to energy? Well, you should remember that energy or work done is equals to any force times distance moved. So imagine that we've got these two, imagine that these two masses were touching, or rather, their centers were touching, and then we put in energy, we put in work to separate them to distance r. How much energy would that take? That's gonna be f times the distance, but we're not talking d in this case because we're dealing with r. So what happens? We just times both of these equations by r. So potential energy for gravitational fields is g m m over r. Similarly for electric fields, k, I'm just gonna write k, q, q, over R. Don't forget that the force for a gravitational field can only be attractive, but for electric fields it can be attractive or repulsive. This is where it gets a little bit trickier. What about if we had our planet again, big M, and we got our field lines going in like that, and I'm not going to put a second mass in here. Instead, I just want to know how strong the field is at any given point. In that case, if I want to find out how strong the field is at any point, I'm only dealing with one mass. The mass, or the charge in electric field case, 
that is producing the field to begin with. So I'm effectively taking the second mass out of the equation. So if I can put it this way, field strength is how much force would something feel? So therefore, I'm dividing by one of the masses for gravitational field strength and dividing by one of the charges for an electric field strength. And that gives me this here. Gravitational field strength, we give the letter little g. And you know for the Earth, that's 9.8 meters per second squared. It's going to be g m over r squared. See, I've gotten rid of the little m. Similar for electric field strength. Unfortunately, we do give it the letter capital E, but it is a field strength, not energy. It's going to be kq over r squared. The unit for field strength is always newtons per something. For gravitational fields, we're talking newtons per kilogram. For electric field strength, newtons per coulomb. So field strength just involves one mass or one charge, the one that is producing the field to begin with. And then all that field strength tells you is if you had something that was this far away, how much force would it feel? And it gives you the number of newtons per kilogram or per coulomb. So if I had a field strength at this point here of 9.8 newtons per kilogram, yes, it can also be meters per second squared because it's also known as acceleration due to gravity. If I have 9.8 newtons per kilogram, that means that if I did have a kilogram of mass there, it would feel 9.8 newtons. If I had two kilograms there, each kilogram is going to experience 9.8 newtons. So it's going to be double that, 19.6 and so on and so forth. So if you have a field strength and you want to know what the actual force is, not just the force per kilogram or coulomb, all you have to do is times by the second mass that you have in play or the second charge. Now there's a similar idea for energy as well. Instead of how much force would something feel, in this case, how much energy should something need? So again, we're dividing by mass, and divided by charge to get to this new thing. And whatever we've got is going to be equals to G M over R. Same thing for electric field. What is this? We call this potential. And we give that the letter V. Hang on a minute. V, potential, potential difference. Yes, it is exactly the same thing. We have energy going to potential. We know that voltage or potential difference is work done per unit charge. That's what we've done. We've taken our energy divided by the second charge to just get our potential. How much energy should something need? Well, the question is to do what? The actual definition is to move from infinity to that point. That's going to be one kilogram or one coulomb. And that is the definition of potential. It's the energy needed to move a one kilogram of mass, if it's a gravitational field, or one coulomb of charge, if it's an electric field, from infinity to that point. Now, you might realize that for a gravitational field, you need to put in energy to move something further away. So that's why we have a minus in front. But that's not hugely important. The important thing about potential is the change in potential, the change in energy per kilogram or per coulomb to move something from a certain distance to another distance away. We can draw equipotentials. In other words, draw lines that show the same potential. Equi means the same, equal. So let's say that this line here represents a potential of minus 10 joules per kilogram. This line here represents minus four joules per kilogram. The important thing is knowing what happens when we move from one potential to the other. In this case, the change in potential is going to be six joules per kilogram. If we know that, then what we can do is times by the number of kilograms that our mass actually is to find out how much energy would be needed to do that. So again, to get from potential to actual potential energy, all you have to do is times by the mass or the charge to get back. Now then, there is one more link. You might realize that these equations are very similar. To get from here to here, you'll notice that to get from kq over r to kq over r squared, all we have to do is divide by 
are. So it turns out that field strength in both cases is merely the potential divided by the distance. So that's why you can say that G is delta V over delta R. Same thing for electric field. That's why field strength is also known as potential gradient. In other words, how does the potential change with distance? So electric field strength is also known as potential gradient, so it can be newtons per coulomb or volts per meter. Gravitational field strength, also known as acceleration due to gravity, can also be calculated doing potential divided by distance. We don't give it the unit volts per meter though, so I probably should just leave that in blue. So hopefully you can see how all four of these things, force, potential energy, potential, and field strength all link together. Force and potential energy require two masses or two charges. Field strength and potential are all about how much force would something feel, how much energy would something need. So they only need one mass or one charge, the mass or charge that's creating the field to begin with. To go from these to these, all we have to do is times by the second mass or charge. Just one last thing, sometimes you'll be given a graph of potential V against separation and you'll get this sort of shape there. This can be for a gravitational field or an electric field and because we know that field strength is changing potential with distance, the gradient gives you G or E, the field strength. So you can find out the field strength at any point by taking the gradient at that point on the graph. Similarly, you could get given a graph of field strength, either one, with distance. It's the area under the graph that gives you the potential. So just a few more things. Let's say that we got two plates here, and these are parallel plates, and they're attached to something that is providing a PD of 10 volts. So we have our voltage, we have our potential difference in between. We can know what distance these plates are separated by. Now, say I have a charge in here, Q. I wanted to find out what force this charge would feel. In order to find out force, I need my field strength times my charge. I have this, but I don't have field strength. But like we said earlier on, field strength is also known as potential gradient, and that is the voltage, the potential difference divided by separation, D. So let's say that this is two meters here, then this is going to be 10 volts divided by two. We have a field strength of five newtons per coulomb. Once I've got my field strength, then I can times by my charge to find out what force that would actually be. So there we go for parallel plates, and this only works for parallel plates. You can take our voltage divided by the separation, that gives us the field strength. We know that if we have a planet, then our field strength from the surface is proportional to one over R squared. So it should have this shape here. But what's going on inside of the planet? It might surprise you to learn that the field strength increases linearly from the center. So we would expect the field strength to be zero at the center because we have mass pulling in all directions. But as we go further away, it increases linearly. That's because our field strength varies with R squared, but we have a volume which is proportional to R cubed. So ultimately, this ends up being proportional to R. It's really important that you understand that you can have a resultant force and field strength. In other words, can be zero. Both force and field strength can be equals to zero. Let's say that we have a mass here and one and a second mass here and two, and then we have a little mass in between and they're separated by R1 and R2. And if the mass is just sitting there, then we know that the force between the two bodies here equals the force due to the two bodies here. So at this point, there is no resultant force. So the same thing goes for their field strengths as well at that point. Don't forget that we don't need that mass in order for the field strength to be zero. Just one thing to be wary of, if we have two masses that are touching, like we said, we know that their separation is from their centers. And sometimes what will happen is we'll have two bodies that are touching to begin with and then separated by another distance. And it will seem like the separation has gone from zero to whatever the distance is. Not so. The separation to begin with is the two radii of these masses added together. And again, just be careful that if instead you're given separation of their surfaces, then you need to add on 
the radius of the bodies as well in order for the separation to be correct. One last thing, potential cannot be zero. All right, except at infinity. This is always true for gravitational fields and electric fields, so long as there's only one type of charge present. Potential can be zero, for example, halfway in between a proton and an electron. That's because the potentials are negative and positive, equal but opposite, and so when you add them up, they add up to zero. So let's say that I have lots of positive charges and they're all producing their own electric field. So here are some equipotentials for all of them. Now say I wanted to find out what the potential is at this point here. There's a potential due to Q1, potential due to Q2, and a potential due to Q3. If I know all of these distances here, R1, R2, R3, how on earth do I find out the overall potential? It's as easy as just adding them up. So the potential at that point is the potential due to Q1 plus the potential due to Q2 plus the potential due to Q3. If you have any questions or suggestions, then please leave it in a comment down below. And I'll see you next time.